This is Kevin Given. I'm reading from my novel, Last Rites, The Return of Sebastian Vassilis, which is book one in the Carl Vincent Vampire Hunter series. The Collapse of Bryant Enterprises. As a boy, Gabriel Bryant was fascinated with Japanese culture and dreamed of visiting the Buddhist temple at Shichinoji. When he moved to Japan in 1982 as an adult, he became a Buddhist. He attended the temple on a regular basis, but by 1987, that didn't help much. Sweat ran down his face into his collar as he looked over his financial statements. The money had been hemorrhaging from his corporation since his competitor opened up for business a couple of years earlier. He didn't know that this was the Monday that would go down in history as Black Monday, October 19th, 1987. All he knew was that he was getting slammed. The U.S. market had dropped over 22%. Closer to home, the Hong Kong stocks had declined by over 45% that day, which hurt even more since he traded with the Chinese too. In 1982, Osaka was the third largest city in Japan and the focal point of a chain of industrial cities. During the day, commuters helped Osaka's population swell to the point where it had almost as many people as Tokyo. It seemed to be the perfect place for Gabe to set up shop in his import-export business. Back in 1982, the economy was recovering from a recession. The era of Reaganomics had begun in America. His import-export business looked like it would prosper for many years to come. It looked good on paper, anyway. In practice, his business took one bad turn after another. During the first year of the business, he made a small profit, and each subsequent year seemed to see about the same profit as the one before. He wasn't happy with that small profit margin, as he had greater ambitions for his company, but he lacked the savvy to make the gains he was looking for. He should have been happy that at least he was ahead of the game. Then about two years ago, a competitor sucked the life out of Bryant Enterprises and he didn't know how to fight back. Hank Nelson Industries had moved in and in a big way. Gabe lost about 20% of his business that year and almost 40% the following year. He ran his fingers through what was left of the thinning red hair on top of his head. Sweat dripped off his brow into his blue eyes. It stung so he ran to the restroom and splashed his face with water to clear the burning sensation. He looked at himself in the mirror. He was as gaunt as a prisoner of war. Gabe had been underweight all his life, but he had really been losing weight for three months as a result of worry and poor eating habits. Now he looked seriously malnourished. His five foot eight inch frame, once close to a healthy 145 pounds, now carried a mere 115 pounds. He was only 38 years old, but the increasingly sleepless nights that he spent worrying for his family caused him to age so quickly he looked ready for retirement. His skin was wrinkled and puckered. His horn-rimmed glasses looked like they belonged to someone younger. Maybe his son, if he had a son. Gabe looked down at his desk. His depression faded as he stared at the photograph. God, they're so beautiful, Gabe said as he picked up the picture of his wife and daughter that was sitting on the desk. He smiled as he thought about the former Satu Rena, now Rena Bryant, and the beautiful daughter they had together, Catherine. Rena was petite, which is how Gabe liked his woman, since he himself was small. He ran his fingers along the silky smooth black hair that flowed down to her waist in the photograph. Then his fingers lightly touched her pretty face and he caressed her slightly upturned nose as his fingers slid along those very thin lips. He smiled as he thought of how uniquely beautiful her skin tone was. It was dark, but different from other Asian women. Her mother was Japanese and her father had been part African American, part Caucasian, giving her a unique skin tone all her own. Many mistook her for being Indian. Gabe's mind wandered. He thought of how Rena didn't pay close attention to the business. As long as her husband provided for the family, she was fine. She suspected something was wrong, but didn't know how serious the problem was. Gabe thought of how lucky he was to have such a beautiful young wife. Rena was 10 years younger than he was, 
and at 28 was able to turn many heads. And I looked 20 years older, Gabe thought. His attitude the last few months affected their relationship. He withdrew every time she asked him about the business and barely spoke to her at all outside of small talk and pleasantries. He knew she was turning solemn, smiling less and less. He hadn't brought her flowers in nine months. When they first moved to Osaka, Gabe was a hopeless romantic and brought her flowers every three months. He loved her with all his heart, but couldn't motivate himself to do anything to show it. He couldn't help feeling that he was losing this beautiful wife. Rena was used to the finer things in life, and Gabe didn't know how much longer he could manipulate the funds in his business to make it seem like they were prosperous. He needed money, and he needed it now. All Gabe wanted to do was provide for his family, and now he was facing bankruptcy. Well, honestly, it wasn't just about his family. Gabe opened the top right-hand desk drawer and pulled out the revolver that he kept there. He knew that if he couldn't live the way he wanted to, he wouldn't live at all. He loved his family, but he loved money more, which the good book says is the root of all evil. He stared at the gun. He played with the safety. It was so tempting to cop out and just end everything the easy way. But he loved his family. It has to look like an accident, he thought out loud. If he committed suicide, then Rena and Kate would get nothing from his life insurance policy. He put the gun back in the top drawer, then shut it. The door buzzer rang. He had to let his secretary go about a month earlier, so he answered it. Hello? Gabe, it's Akio, his brother-in-law said into the intercom. It's open, Gabe responded as he hit the buzzer to let Akio in. Gabe waited patiently as he knew Akio would be riding the elevator to his floor. After a few minutes, he heard the door knock. It's open, Gabe said again. Akio entered the office and shook Gabe's hand. He admired his brother-in-law's attire olive green suit without a wrinkle in sight. The perfect crease down the front of his pants showed that Akio cared about his appearance. His jet black hair was slicked back without a one out of place. The perfect stereotype of a Yakuza gang member. How's it going? Gabe asked. Real good. How's the business holding out? It ain't. I don't think I'll survive this stock market. It's going to take years to recover. By then, I'll be bankrupt. How will you provide for my sister? I'll find a way, Akio. I, I won't let you down. I love Rena and Kate. I know you do, but they can't live like peasants, Akio's voice rose. Gabe thought that this thin Japanese man had an imposing sound for a man of his tiny stature. I know. I, I have a life insurance policy. One way or another, they will survive. Stop talking like a fool. You will see your daughter graduate, then go to college. Lord knows I want to, Gabe sighed and put his head in his hands. I just don't know how to make it happen any other way. I know a way. Gabriel Bryant lifted his head and stared intensely into Akio's eyes for a long moment. You don't mean that Yakuza gang that you're involved with. They are honorable people. If you need money, they can help. I don't know if I want to get involved in anything illegal. You don't seem to have much of a choice. I can set up a meeting with Royasok. As an American, you can't join, but you will earn enough working for the Inago Akai to take care of my sister and niece. I don't know if I can do what they would expect me to do. It can't hurt just to talk to him, and your alternative is bleak. You're right about that. Gabe paused for another long minute as he tried to think. Okay, let's set up a meeting, just to talk. Gabe spent the rest of the day trying to figure out if he should actually talk to these bastards. He knew deep down that it was wrong. But he also knew that he wanted to be with his family and watch his daughter grow up. Since he couldn't really join the gang, he figured, how bad can it really be? He'd always be on the outside. He looked at the calendar on his desk. Tomorrow was Kate's birthday, and he knew that he had to get her a present. His decision was made. After Akio left the office, Gabe went home. On his way home, he stopped at a store and looked around till he found something appropriate for an eight-year-old girl. After an hour of shopping, he picked up a Daruma doll and purchased it. He didn't have enough money, but he would find it somehow. His credit card still had some funds available, so he used that. The only thing he could think about was the joy that he would see on his daughter's face. He pulled out the credit card, 
paid for the present, wrapped it, and then went home. Daddy, Daddy! Gabe heard his daughter's voice, and his heart leapt. He had a gift in his arms, and he knew that she knew it was for her birthday. Be careful with that pumpkin, Gabe said. What is it? Open it and find out. Kate tore off the paper wrapping and held her present high. It's a doll. A Daruma doll. Oh, Daddy, he's beautiful. Just like my princess. Kate ran up to her father and hugged him. Gabe saw a huge smile form on his daughter's face, and he knew that he wanted to watch his beautiful daughter grow up. Kate ran up to her father and hugged him. Gabe saw a huge smile form on his daughter's face, and he knew that he wanted to watch his beautiful daughter grow up. Rena came out from the kitchen and kissed her husband. You always had a knack for buying the right gift, she said and smiled. Akio came to visit me today, Gabe said, frowning. The smile left Rena's face. She knew that there would only be one reason for her brother to visit her husband's office. Are things that bad? she asked. He tried to smile but couldn't. He felt the blood drain from his face and knew that his skin had gone pale. We don't have much of a choice. His wife turned her back and walked towards the kitchen. She stopped at the threshold and spoke without looking back at him. You have to do what's best, was all she could say.